Bienvenidos al Capitolio de, de Florida, Tallahassee, Florida. Gracias por estar con nosotros en este día. Y vamos a darle gracias al representante Bob Cortés, que está con nosotros ahora. Mismo. Y David Santiago, una persona, de un representante de David Santiago de Deltona. Muchas personas es posible que no lo conocen, porque está en la esquinita, ¿sabes? De donde está el pueblo puertorriqueño. But he's a good guy, he's from New York. That makes him a better guy. Um, and, and just to let you know, the, the, our, our um, objective here today is actually to bring information to the legislature. But because the way the timing, the timing of, of this event, it comes at the end of session. And right now, they are in the end of session. So they've got bills upon bills that they have to vote on. They'll be popping in and out to uh, participate in here, but that's why they can't sit here all day long because they're actually in session and they're taking bills. So I want to take thanks to both Bob and David for, for taking the time to be here with us today and then jump right into the program. As we indicated last night, the purpose of, of, of having Puerto Rico Day always started off as a cultural event, right? Just started as a way to celebrate the, the culture, the participation, of the, the citizens of Florida who consider themselves uh, Puerto Rican. And now that we have a, a come over one million, I hope you have your bu bumper stickers that we gave to you, uh, that we're over one million, uh, it takes, it's time for us to take responsibility for being citizens of the state of Florida and uh, assisting in the solutions that come, that are uh, come to Florida. Part of the problems or situation is that the migration from Puerto Rico Uh, which is draining Puerto Rico due to the financial crisis, um, brings opportunities for us here in Florida to deal with the situation. And so Puerto Rico Day this year is dedicated to the concept of not only celebrating the participation and the culture of the Puerto Ricans, the citizens of Florida, but also taking upon la batuta of our responsibility as citizens of Florida and finding solutions to working with with our colleagues and, and our friends and other citizens of the state of Florida. So in that capacity, we have tremendous talent in, in our community. We, we better, who better than us, to analyze the situation, to know what's going on, and to find solutions than our people, our experts, and, and to that extent, we're going to deal with this particular panel, which is going to deal with the demographics of Puerto Ricans in the state of Florida, and what that means. So let me introduce um, the eminent. Um, I don't have enough words to describe the gentleman I'm about to describe. He's, his name is Edwin Melendez. He's a, doc, he's a doctor, in, uh, of course, of, 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 of uh, letters. In, and, but what he does as director of Centro de Estudios Puerto Ricanos from Hunter College is an extraordinary task that all of us have to be grateful to him for, because he is documenting through Hunter College and the work that he's doing, he's documenting the story of the Puerto Rican community, a culture that refuses to die, a culture that refuses to be engulfed, that refuses, that continues to strive despite 118 years being part of El Gigante del Norte. It's an amazing task, it's an amazing community, it's an amazing culture. And Dr. Melendez, as director of uh, Centro, um, is, uh, is documenting everything. So please, let's give him a big round of applause. Gracias, Tony, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here this morning. It's great to be back in Florida. It's, uh, I have to confess, the first time that I attend this particular gathering, uh, Puerto Rico Day, and I hope won't be the, the last. So let me... Closer? Yeah, please stay closer. Okay. Closer. Much better. So I said, buenos dias. So uh, let, me, let me jump into it. Uh, I'm going to try to present some points. I know my, my colleagues are going to complement what I say, so I'm going to skip some slides. But let me say that everything related to the crisis is posted on our website. 
We have plenty of presentations last year in a summit that we did, and all kind of uh, documentation that supports, uh, if you want to have more information about that. I want to jump a little bit faster to what's happening in Florida, because this gathering is about that impact. But I have two or three talking points related to what's happening in Puerto Rico, the impact that it has in the United States, in our uh, stateside communities, Puerto Rican communities, and then a little bit about the impact of, of that in Florida. And uh, Jose is also going to talk about uh, an important point, which is the, the, the diaspora solidarity movement, the role of the Hispanic Federation, but the role of other uh, organizations as well. So let me, let me jump into it, and, and don't panic if I go too fast. All of this is going to be posted and uh, hopefully you have more time to, uh, to revise. So the crisis in Puerto Rico uh, has three main uh, determinants, right? The elimination of Section 936, uh, that was a tax exemption to, a federal tax exemption to corporations operating in Puerto Rico. The main industry affected by that was the pharmaceutical industry, and employment was reduced from 140,000 jobs to less than 70,000, but the average salary for those workers was over $70,000. So it was a huge impact in the economy. The, the, the public uh, collection of taxes never recovered from that, and therefore Puerto Rico entered in a fiscal crisis, and the brilliant solution of our elected officials was to borrow money. And that ended up in a, in a debt crisis that we're still uh, going through it. So let me just uh, say those things. And by the way, you know, Puerto Rico is subjected to congressional legislation. So they have responsibility in what happens. For example, party, medical, uh, Medicaid, and other services is important to us, and it can only be affected by Congress. Uh, so having said that, those factors converge to create the crisis that we have uh, currently. The, the fiscal, I'm sorry, the financial crisis in the U.S. didn't help. Uh, perhaps we can talk about that later. But that results, uh, resulted in several things, right? One was the, the austerity measures impacted Puerto Rico, and they're going through very tough times, right? I'm going to present some data in a second. But the other thing is that it created a massive migration wave to the United States. Okay, we are perhaps in the period where most Puerto Ricans have left, even more than the so-called uh, Great Migration of the 1950s. I'm going to probably show you a little bit about that. But so uh, the humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico is just unfolding. We're not there yet, but you know, a lot. You know, poverty is almost 50 percent, child poverty is almost 60 percent, and I can go on down the list. Right? Unemployment is not too high because participation rate is so low. Right? It's about 12.5% as a year ago, but that's double the, the, the rate here in the States. And I can go on citing data on this, but the point is things are not going well down there. So uh, as a result of that, Congress did take action. They imposed a law that is called PROMESA. That law has two main components, and, and they both are controversial to different people. The first and most important one is that it put a state on the debt, you know, it gives us a break to figure out how to get out of this mess, but also uh, gives the, opens the door for debt restructuring, and that's what, what's happening next week. So I don't want to get into much detail about that, but we're in a critical time for that, for, for in that regard. And the second thing that it did was to impose an oversight control board, an oversight board that has authority over any local law. So they have to approve a fiscal plan, they have to approve a budget, and, and we're going through that process as well. The idea, and there are other clauses, but those are two the, the main the main things that happen. So Puerto Rico is still uh, in the midst of that, trying to find solutions to that debt crisis. Uh, so um, uh, the reaction in Puerto Rico to that, as should be expected, uh, was not necessarily partisan. I'm going to show you some data on that. But the fact is that uh, it's a mixed reaction. There are some people that are really affected by the crisis that are very up in arms and, and protesting for it. But there is a wide support for uh, PROMESA, believe it or not. The, in public opinions, okay, before uh, PROMESA was enacted, support for the law was less than 50%. Right after and before the elections of November, the uh, support spiked to over 60% of the population. And it, it, it was across political parties. Independence and pro statehood uh, the New Progressive Party people were more supportive, but there was across the board support. Then you ask, why is Puerto Rico people supporting an oversight board that gives control to, you know, 
appointees instead of the elected officials? And the answer is the next slide. Because Puerto Ricans do not trust their governing institutions. That, that's what the poll says. Who do they trust? Federal institutions, the federal court, the, fed, you know, the FBI, you know. So that's where we are. So people have lost trust in their inst political institutions, and they now ha have to rely on federal institutions to sort of have trust that this is going to go somewhere, that we're not stuck in the crisis. So that's a little bit of the, of the background. Now, right now, where we are with the oversight board is a very critical period. I don't, don't want to get into too many details, but right now, the state on the, de on the debt expires May 1st, okay? So we're days away. The day before, the governor has to submit a budget that, that coincides, is supported by the fiscal plan that was approved by the oversight board. That means that the austerity is going to start kicking in. Now, the good thing about what the, the oversight board has done I mean, there are all, all kinds of controversies, right? They went back and forth on the terms of, that, of those agreements, but this is a very telling graphic. The budgeted amount to repay the debt is between 20 and 30% on the dollar of what would have been required to repay. So even whatever you say about the oversight board, please keep in mind that what they have authorized to repay is a fraction of what Puerto Rico would have had to pay if in the absence of PROMESA. The price of that is the loss of democratic processes. But that's the, tra you know, the graphic shows you that trade-off, right? We don't know the specific of, of that austerity that is coming, that's coming over the next week. But anyway, having said that, uh, they, so the, the oversight board is the only entity that can take the debt restructuring to federal court. That's expected to happen May 1st. If it doesn't happen May 1st, it's going to be a major you know, litigation, legal chaos, okay? Let's hope we don't get there. Uh, uh, maybe in the Q&A we can go a bit more about that. So, you know, and that doesn't resolve all the debt. For example, PREPA owns about, you know, short of $10 billion. They have been going back and forth renegotiating that, and the terms are like 85 cents on the dollar. So whether the oversight board is going to approve that remains to be seen. The value of those stocks is more like 50%. But, so there is a big gap in terms of what the bondholders expect, and what Puerto Rico is saying they're going to pay, and what the debt may, may end up being in federal court. So that's where we are in Puerto Rico. Now, how does it matter to you? Okay, Why are we here today? Well, because look at that graphic. That's the historical migration uh, from Puerto Rico to the US. Okay, Forget about the different colors. What it matters is that that's the trend of migration. And if you look at the 50s, and you look at what's happening right now, you can see where the story is. Now, that migration out of Puerto Rico results in the following. That today, the people who live in Puerto Rico are about maybe 40% of the total Puerto Rican population. Okay, 60% or more live, reside, stay side. Look at those graphics. That's the story of our crisis. People are leaving the island, okay? That's very important, why? Because of those of us who are here in the state side, 70% of us are US born. This is the land that we know. My children were both born in, in this land. Their first language is English. What does that mean to Puerto Rican identity? That's why we have Julie here later. You know, she's gonna tell us that story, but I'm not gonna go there. Uh, whoa, uh, I think I, I've, uh, I don't know what to do now. But anyway, so that resulted in migration over all, all the, the United States. Uh, actually, Florida is the uh, most recipient of that. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just skip. Uh, Puerto Ricans have brought, uh, uh, that is bus small business, right? Yeah. So th there is a big boom in small businesses driven by the Puerto Rican population. You know, people come. And, and people buy ethnic, group, uh, ethnic foods and stuff like that. So it's a big boom. That data is 2012, so I expect the 20, uh, 2017 data that's going to come out to be more significant than that. The next slides are about the impact of, uh, you know, the impact of this new population on health services. And those are posted in our website. We have a new sheet for Florida. It's, uh, you know, state of Florida 2015. You can download it from our uh, uh, and it has all those details. So let me skip that. But the migrants 
If you look at the comparison of the uh, uninsured rates, the, the Puerto Rican migrants have a much higher rate of uninsured than the others, as should be expected. It takes a while for them to, to, uh, to adjust. Uh, that map that you see there is about the overlapping uh, between uh, Medicaid expansion and, and, the port and the uninsured. So that gravity, uh, gravity model tells you the story. Uh, Jose is going to talk more about the diaspora, um, uh, you know, uh, engagement, but let me, let me uh, make uh, two comments, okay? If you look at the purchasing power of the Puerto Rican community, including Puerto Rico, you can see where New York and, and Florida are. We are uh, together more significant than all the income that Puerto Ricans in the island have. So the tremendous power that we have moving forward to affect not just what happens in Puerto Rico, but what happens stateside, I think is very important. Um, so uh, my final thought is, as Tony suggested, it is time for action. We gotta do this, not just for Puerto Rico, but for our communities here in the States. Right. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me, um, this, the battle as we, has been engaged and has been set forth by Dr. Melendez is fought not only on the intellectual level where we find and do the research and find the facts and, and, and to know what the problem is, but it is also fought with action. And that action comes from groups like many of you that represent here, but one of those groups that's with us today who's been a supporter of, of this event and other events that we have done in Central Florida is Hispanic Federation, one of the largest, if not the largest, advocacy groups um, I mean Hispanics in, in the United States. And with us today is Jose Davila, who's Vice President for the Policy and Government Relations for the Hispanic Federations. And since 2012, he has coordinated the Federation's policy, advocacy, government relations, and civic engagement efforts nationally and in several states, including New York, Connecticut, and Florida. He also serves on the board of New York City's School Support Services a nonprofit organization charged with administering the custodial system for the city's 1,700 public schools. Previously, he worked at the New York City Public Advocates Office, the New York Immigration Coalition, the Fiscal Policy Institute, Bronx Works, and uh, NYPRG. Jose is a Bronx native of Puerto Rico descent. Vamos a darle a warm flower of applause to Jose Davila. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony, and, and uh, to my distinguished panelists. Uh, really great to be here with you all. Um, it's really impressive to see so many people come from across the state, all the way to the capital, to learn about issues that are important to our community, uh, to have a dialogue, and really to ideally uh, educate and influence our leaders in Tallahassee to um, you know, continue to help us in addressing um, both the crisis back on the island as well as what it means for our communities across the state. So um, the Hispanic Federation uh, is a proud partner of Puerto Rico Day in Tallahassee. I know many of you were there last night for the reception. Thank you for being there. Uh, it was a great honor to honor those uh, amazing uh, honorees um, and also to celebrate with you all. So, so thank you very much for your time. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what is Hispanic Federations and really the diaspora's role throughout the United States um, and really helping uh, Puerto Rico and really um, how Florida uh, and, and Boricuas here can play a major role in helping the island and helping our communities here as well. Um, we actually issued two reports in the last year or so, um, one that uh, speaks to uh, what is actually happening on the island um, and what's sort of our platform, particularly looking at what can Washington do, right? Um, so the Federation isn't based um, in San Juan, for example, right? We're based in Orlando and in Hartford, and in Washington, and New York City, and elsewhere. Um, so we're not on the island. Um, and actually, we really got engaged on the issue of the debt crisis in the last couple of years um, due to ex experts like Edwin and so many others um, who have come to us with great ideas about what can be done by Washington to help the island through this crisis, right? Um, so we issued a report uh, that sort of pulls together the best thinking of the leaders, economists, um, environmentalists, um, and others who said, uh, here's what needs to happen to really assist the island. So that's one report. The second report we released uh, in the past year looked at what are the changing demographics um, in Orlando, in Central Florida, and throughout the state of Florida, looking at the Puerto Rican community and the Latino community overall, 
And I'm sure the findings of the report that we'll share, some of them uh, are things I think we all already know. And it was our job uh, to work with you all to tell that story to the media, to our leaders in Tallahassee and others who really need to, need to know um, what's happening to Florida and what's the changing landscape and what does that mean for the Puerto Rican community. So uh, Edwin spoke about the, uh, the, the crisis. And so, um, you know, just to, to recap, the, the basic issues that we saw is, first and foremost, how do we deal with the $72 billion debt plus all the pension money that's still owed to families and workers um, on the island. That was the, you know, the big sort of uh, issue that needed to be addressed first in order to really address all the other issues that are happening. And so um, the PROMESA bill that was passed by Congress with bipartisan support um, in the Congress that really you know, never does anything for anything was in some ways amazing, um, in some ways very necessary, and in many ways also very troubling. Um, and the Federation uh, did work to move the bill along. In the end, we really didn't support the final bill, and we know there are many flaws to it, but the, 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 the two good things in the bill clearly are the stay on litigation, as Edwin mentioned. So you can see the re reports we put out. Uh, those are the, the covers for the last two reports. Um, and they're on our website, hispanicfederation.org, and I'll, I'll restate that, uh, the website at the end. But it's on our website, great information for you all uh, on the debt crisis and also on um, the sort of portrait of the Latino demographics, consumer uh, priorities, et cetera, uh, for the state of Florida. So again, uh, we encourage you to go download those website, uh, those reports and take a look at them. Um, and then the crisis. Um, so again, um, the PROMESA bill was, was key in having a stay on any more litigation that would have really hampered any ability to resolve the debt. And then obviously some form of both auditing the debt, because not all the debt is legal, and we've heard this conversation around the 72 billion, uh, much of it, and in fact, they're looking at now upwards of maybe two thirds of it actually being illegally acquired or um, put on the island. So the hope is that this oversight board that's put forth that has its issues will ultimately recommend and approve and with the work, work of Congress and of the local government to actually say, let's uh, wipe away two thirds of this debt and make it actually repayable. Yes, obviously the island, the local government has some responsibility to address it, uh, but that 72 billion that everyone knew was, uh, was really a phony number and we hope that um, the local government really supports efforts to reduce the debt and then pay it at a reasonable rate. Um, you know, aside from that, uh, Edwin uh, mentioned the out-migration being a big concern to the island, talented professionals and families leaving the island, m mainly to central Florida, but other places across the United States. It's also in many ways a challenge and an opportunity for central Florida and the whole state of Florida. And so what does that mean for opportunity, uh, needs, challenges uh, for our local communities? Also, um, the talk about austerity, and we are very clear at the Federation. We are past the point of austerity. Uh, there are no more rabbits to pull out of a hat. There are no more cuts to make, no more layoffs to make. The island has shuttered schools, had massive layoffs, and while that's gonna continue, we know that that's not something we support, and this is why we're looking to Washington to step in to really invest in the island to help the island turn around economically. Uh, we've heard about the healthcare crisis and general inequities that have led to that, being left out of the Affordable Care Act many years ago. Um, even the bill that the, uh, was put forth by Congress recently that we didn't support still left out Puerto Rico in any new health care laws. And so what does that mean for the, the, the running out of funding for, for health care in Puerto Rico and what needs to happen in Congress to really address uh, this issue moving forward? Um, and then also just o over time, uh, all the sort of inequities that have come forth um, from Washington put on the island. And so on the next slide, um, we talk about sort of what's our priority uh, platform for um, the island, and it's really around uh, six or seven key things. Um, and you see it on the big screen as well. Uh, we, we mentioned we support bankruptcy protections, debt restructuring, debt relief, and debt auditing. That's all really key to really um, restoring credibility for the island and really having ho hopefully a, a strong economic path moving forward. Uh, we support uh, healthcare parity, right? The island only gets a 50% reimbursement rate on, on, on sort of basic Medicaid uh, reimbursement, right? And that's a problem, right? So places like Alabama, New York, everywhere gets 100% reimbursement, but not Puerto Rico, right? We're U.S. citizens, why are we getting half of what everybody else gets in the, in the, in the donation? So we wanna make sure that that loophole is closed and that the island gets its fair share of reimbursement to make sure we have a strong healthcare industry. And obviously, in being included in the Affordable Care Act or other reforms will be helpful to restoring healthcare quality on the island. Um, it's amazing that the island is not a leader in clean energy, right? The energy uh, sector is overpriced. Uh, it's old fossil fuel energies. And so why, why isn't the, the island leading the nation on wind power, solar power? There's so many opportunities there. And so Congress would be wise and the private sector would be wise to invest 
uh, offer tax credits, whatever, to really help bolster this clean energy sector on the island to lower costs for residents and really make sure our uh, uh, green, green footprint, our carbon footprint is minimalized to really support our, our children's future. Um, progressive tax reforms. Um, you know, we don't have a position on the 936 and other sort of business tax credits for the most part, but for sure there are basic progressive um, income tax measures that can be taken like uh, uh, mandating the earned income tax credit for low-income families or expanding to the uh, child tax credit to include all children on the island, which it doesn't clearly cover. So there are things that can be done to help working families right now that Washington can do and that there's bipartisan support for. Um, and, then, and then lastly, this issue around the Jones Act. Um, and uh, I mean, people have talked about it uh, for, certainly for a long time. Uh, and the real challenge there, as people know, is that uh, the shipping costs that are imposed on the island are incredibly biased. Uh, we don't agree necessarily with our labor brothers and sisters on the mainland about how to resolve that, but we think that there should be an amendment to that law to really reduce shipping costs for the island and have that parity as well. And then lastly, obviously, there needs to be a massive investment package for the island to really help um, infuse aid uh, to the residents um, in Puerto Rico. So the next slide, um, you know, this is, where, uh, this is where, where is the rationale around why we should get involved, right? Um, if you look at the map, um, you know, Boricuas are everywhere across the United States, uh, but certainly in, in our footprint where the Federation was in New York and Florida and elsewhere. And so um, some of these states are really critically important to uh, both houses in Congress, uh, to both parties in Congress, and to who wants to be the next governor and president, et cetera, right? And so that we have political leverage to really uh, make our voices heard, and that's really the main reason why um, there was even any action in, in uh, Washington last year. Florida was instrumental in, in raising voices to say, you guys need to do something to, reser to resolve this uh, debt crisis. And so, you know, we have that power, and that's why it makes sense for um, us to have, you know, both a sort of a moral uh, responsibility, but a, a civic responsibility as stateside Boricuas to really be supportive of pushing Washington to support the island. Um, now, this is some of the uh, findings from our recent report, the second report that I talked about, about the demographics on the island, uh, in Port Florida. You see that um, upwards of 75% of Puerto Ricans in Florida reside in those 10 counties on the map, mainly in Central Florida, but also South Florida as well. And so uh, we have uh, growing um, sort of needs in these communities, but also hopefully growing political power to get um, things we need for our local uh, you know, state legislature, but also to get members of Congress in these areas to uh, speak out uh, for our community as well. Um, some of the quick findings from the report, uh, basically, you know, uh, Edwin talked about this before, right? Over a million uh, Puerto Ricans in the state of Florida, that's almost a doubling in the last 15 years. I mentioned the 75% residing in 10 counties. Um, this is the numbers from the uh, Latino decisions exit poll from the election, right? 72% voted for Hillary Clinton. These are, these are uh, Puerto Ricans in Florida, 72% voted for Hillary Clinton. 26% for Donald Trump, our current president. Um, you see uh, that uh, Puerto Ricans will be the largest Latino group in Florida by 2020, and that's a big finding as well, and what does that mean for, the, for our power growing forward, moving forward in Florida? Um, we have clear needs that everyone knows about around housing, healthcare, and transportation, and others, and so what does that mean for leaders in Tallahassee increasing aid to Central Florida, South Florida, to make sure our communities can uh, uh, sort of go to school, can get healthcare, have affordable housing, uh, commute to work and, and commute with your families, and that's really important. And then obviously, it's political representation. What does that mean about having folks in Congress? We have Darren Soto now, we have Representative Torres, we have many in, in the, or several, in the, uh, in the House, right? We need to really have more representation of our leadership um, in Tallahassee as well. And then, I think this is uh, the last piece, which is, you know, ways to really raise our voices. And so we want to encourage you all to you know, both help to resolve the crisis and to improve things for folks here in Florida. Keep visiting and calling members of Congress. Come with us to Washington and visit them locally in Central Florida and elsewhere. Um, events like these are great to educate uh, state legislative leaders around the integration needs of Boricuas in Central Florida and elsewhere. Um, tell our story. We should be better about telling our story because talking about the, the, money, the, the money stuff and the, the status stuff is one thing, but if we can tell our stories about what it means for our families back on the island and what it means for us here, that's how we win this debate, and that's how we get folks to really care and do things for our community, frankly. Voter registration, education, mobilization is key, um, and also leveraging our buying power. We are consumers, and, and we're talking to corporate leaders about being vocal for the island and for us as well. And then certainly working with community-based organizations, uh, Mission Bodiqua and so many other ones that are here to help register voters and speak out uh, forcefully about uh, this crisis. 
Um, there's a slide there about some of the work the Federation's done around registering voters, uh, new text technology, uh, candidate forums. Many of you were at these events, certainly in Central Florida. We want to continue to do that in 2017 and beyond. Every year is important, not just presidential years, so we want to encourage you to keep registering voters and really encourage you to keep turning out the vote. Um, and then lastly, um, here's our information. Uh, please go to our website to get those reports, to connect with us. Uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. And obviously, we look forward to your questions and to continue to have this dialogue with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. You know, um, these two reports by experts, in, que son nosotros, o sea, que son nuestros, ¿verdad? Uh, we can all feel very proud that we have these institutions that are working on our behalf. And, and, um, but what we, our obligation here in Florida is to continue this effort. And what we're hope is that myself and people like uh, Frank Torres, who's out there, and, and Sam Lopez, who's here, and, and um, uh, I hope Anna Rivera, I don't know if they're here yet, but there are groups of us, and those of you who are leadership groups, we have to form an infrastructure. All right? We have to form the infrastructure so that this kind of effort can continue into the future so that the academics, as they identify the issues and give us the hard facts for what we see in the street, then we could put it in play over here in Tallahassee and ultimately in Washington, D.C. So the, this is the first time, but it won't be the last time, that we're trying to put ourselves together. So it, this is the stuff that's going to go on, okay? <laughs> So, to continue with this, uh, our, our, our academic representation, Julie Torres is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is currently working on her dissertation research on the Puerto Rican diaspora in Orlando, Florida. Her project engages with feminist analysis of social justice within the Puerto Rican community. Let's welcome Julie Torres. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. I want to thank the organizers of Puerto Rico Day for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm going to, oh, closer. All right, better. Um, I'm going to read out my remarks because I don't want to go over time too much. Um, but my dissertation project, as was mentioned, focuses on this very important migration, um, specifically in the Orlando metropolitan area. As I began my field work, I made the decision to focus on a very important sector of the Puerto Rican community, Puerto Rican women, um, engaging with questions around the role of gender and social justice efforts in the community. Um, although I won't be presenting on that aspect of my research today, um, perhaps at a later date when I've done more of that data analysis, um, I do hope to share with you some of the aspects of my research today um, as it relates to this panel. So I'll preface my presentation by saying that I am a cultural anthropologist by training. Um, so my talk might be a little bit different from the other panelists um, since I use more of a qualitative approach to my research. And I do that largely by interviewing people and attending events in the community. I hope to bring more of a human-centered perspective to some of the data that has been presented thus far. Uh, because while the numbers are important and useful to my own work, I think it's also important to hear from the voices of the diaspora in their own words. So in the first half of my talk, I'm going to share with you some of those migration narratives. And in the second half, I'd like to shift gears a little bit to talk about the ways in which Puerto Ricans are mobilizing to improve the situation of both those on the island of Puerto Rico and in the mainland US. And just so you're aware, in order to protect people's identities, I use fake names, I avoid mentioning any names of organizations. Some of you might know what I'm talking about, but I'm being vague on purpose. So before I get into some of those narratives and moments, uh, I wanna briefly contextualize some of the history of Puerto Rican migration to Florida. Now, early migration to Florida was facilitated by various factors, uh, such as agricultural ventures of a few business elite in the 1940s, as well as contract farm worker programs which were supported by the Migration Division of Puerto Rico's Department of Labor. In the years that followed, the demand for factory workers, military recruitment, and the growth of certain industries, such as the garment industry in Miami and the cigar making industry in Tampa, brought more Puerto Ricans to the state. In the mid-1970s, Puerto Rican engineers from the University of Puerto Rico in Mayagüez 
were also recruited by NASA and began to arrive in Central Florida. However, migration to Orlando in particular picked up in the late 1960s as real estate companies began to advertise properties in Spanish language newspapers in Puerto Rico and later in 1971 with the opening of Walt Disney's theme park, which brought jobs and even further increased real estate speculation to the area. However, at this present historical moment, the economic crisis in Puerto Rico is characterized by over a $72 billion debt, as we've heard, and has led record numbers of Puerto Ricans to depart the island. So while Puerto Rican migration to Florida is not entirely new, uh, there's no denying that there has been a shift in migration patterns and an increase in numbers in recent years. Now, while not everyone I spoke with migrated because of the economic crisis, several did migrate with the hopes of better employment, educational, and medical opportunities for themselves or their children on the U.S. mainland. For instance, as we sat in the lobby of a local Orlando hospital, Juan, a nurse who migrated from Puerto Rico four years ago, recounted his motivations for leaving. Quote, I left because of economic factors. With our professions, we work a lot, basically Sunday to Sunday, but the pay is almost nothing. You can hardly afford anything. And my wife is also a nurse, but it's not enough. There's no way we can live while working. Maybe if you're retired, the people who work, the taxes, the utilities, it's impossible, end quote. Lisa, on the other hand, a doctor who migrated two years ago was fairly content with her salary, but because of the changes to the healthcare system on the island, she grew increasingly frustrated with her work-life balance. Quote, what made me move was one night, I was doing my weekend call. There were three of us, so every third weekend I was off. That weekend, I was working. I had to take call from the hospital and I would round, and I could see maybe 75 patients in one day. And then one night I was driving home, I talked to my husband and he said the kids were already sleeping. And I got so happy thinking how good it was that they were already asleep. But then I just started crying. I thought I have to do something because I cannot say that I'm not happy, I'm going, that I'm happy that I'm not going to see my girls, end quote. Shortly after that day, Lisa contacted a recruiter and found a job in an Orlando hospital where she was able to work half the amount of hours for the same pay. Yvette, a teacher on the island, shared the effects of the fiscal crisis on her own career in education. Quote, in 2005, that was the time when things started getting tough in Puerto Rico. In education specifically, they started freezing many positions. Most of the positions in Puerto Rico were cut are granted with Title I funds, so they were cutting those funds, and my position was cut. I was a high school teacher at that point, and they sent me to teach kindergartners. That's when I said, you know what? I'm a high school person. That's my area of strength. That's what I love. Elementary, I did that for a year, but it's not my area. So that summer, I was so drained that I came to visit some friends here that had recently moved and that summer I started talking to my friends and they said, you should apply here, end quote. And Yvette did. And she was able to find the job fairly quickly, although others I've spoken to did not fare so well because of the challenges of professional certifications and testing. Now these three individuals represent just one subset of the population of Puerto Ricans who are migrating, professionals. Their experiences reflect the wide reaching effects of the fiscal crisis. Many of them also face discrimination and stereotyping when they arrive. As Yvette relates, quote, I think there's misconceptions about Puerto Ricans or the Latino community. I'm going to put myself as an example. I'm very well educated. I had great opportunities. So every time they say, oh no, they don't speak English. Listen, my English is from Puerto Rico. They don't speak English over there or they don't have the same educational opportunities. I had really, really great educational opportunities. So I think there's educating the community that we cannot generalize. People have this one perception. They just generalize it to the whole community. I think that's my personal, represent my personal motivation, motivation in what I do. This is what I used to tell my students when I was in the classroom. I represent Puerto Rico. I represent a group of people that strives to do the best, to go as high as I can. The sky is the limit. I'm not that mentality of welfare 
or that kind of mentality that they connect a lot of Puerto Ricans to, end quote. Others I spoke with shared that same sentiment. The perception, quote, this is a quote, the perception is that we come here to take. And when you look at how many jobs sometimes we have and how we are raising our families and how involved we are, you see many families working hard. We come here to work. We want to go to school. We want a better future. When we leave the island, we leave the island in pain. When that plane takes off, we start crying. I get chills just saying it. But once we're here, we start searching. We want to improve our economic situation, improve the way we live. We want to send our kids to better schools. And at the end of the day, we want what everybody else wants." End quote. And I think that this last statement really captures what a deeply emotional experience migration is, um, especially for those who physically leave the island, but not necessarily leave it behind. And this translates into the efforts of several community members who are working to improve the situation of Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricans, both on the island and in Florida. And I think this is a good point of transition, if I, I think I have two minutes left, um, to introduce the idea of cultural citizenship, which is an academic framework um, that's used to think about, that I think is helpful to think about what's going on here in Orlando. Well, not here, but you know what I mean. Uh, so now, all of us in this room know that Puerto Ricans are citizens of the United States, uh, but this idea of cultural citizenship extends beyond these so-called legal categories of citizenship. Uh, so now, I mentioned that Puerto Ricans still face discrimination based on factors such as race, language, class, sexuality, um, and this can lead to the, to the treatment of Puerto Ricans as second-class citizens. But given this, the notion of cultural citizenship helps us understand how individu individuals assert their right to be different and still have a sense of belonging. So I don't want to make this too abstract, so I'll give a few examples of how I've seen this playing out in the community in Orlando. Uh, so I'm briefly going to mention Pulse in a few minutes, so I also just wanted to let everyone know if they feel uncomfortable that they can feel free to leave the room. Um, so one way that this plays out is through local activism. So just this past month, several community leaders and organizations came together to support another Puerto Rican community, um, com uh, community organization's event in Kissimmee. The event, which included a march and a rally with several speakers emphasizing the effects of the fiscal crisis on their lives, sought to bring attention to the crisis in Puerto Rico stateside. But in many ways, it also served to stretch the boundaries of belonging to not only include Florida, but also Puerto Rico, through a deep investment in what's happening on the island. I've also witnessed the budding efforts of Puerto Rican teachers who are mobilizing to help those migrating to Central Florida learn how to navigate the system of obtaining teaching certifications and employment. Their gatherings are not only an attempt to improve the livelihood of Puerto Rican migrants, but also an act of community building, creating a safe space for Puerto Rican teachers to share their experiences and challenges. Uh, so now I also have to mention this past election cycle. The knocking on doors, the push for voter registration, uh, and the attempts to educate the public about the electoral process. Okay. Um, through workshops, uh, events, even local radio shows. And this all speaks to the efforts to increase civic engagement and achieve more political clout for the Puerto Rican community. And many did celebrate successes with the appointment of several Puerto Ricans to office, whom they hope will lend an ear to the concerns of the Puerto Rican community. But I want to highlight the caravanas in particular. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a caravana is a method of campaigning in Puerto Rico that involves a parade of vehicles, uh, often with the windows rolled down to the soundtrack of Spanish music, um, a hand on the car horn, and cars adorned with Puerto Rican flags. So the purpose of these caravanas in Central Florida was to encourage the Puerto Rican community to go out and vote. This pictured caravana from last October also brought together several organizations from across the community. Now, regardless of your party affiliation or whether you think it's an effective method or not, uh, they're an important means of cultural ex expression that almost screams, we're here, we belong, and we need to participate in the political arena. Lastly, I wanted to say just a few words about the tragedy at Pulse. Initially, few media outlets reported that the shooting had occurred during Latin night, 
and that 90% of the victims were Latino. Fewer still mentioned the fact that 23 of the 49 killed were Puerto Rican. But as mourners gathered to grieve those lost, I think that the objects that they left behind were not simply expressions of ethnic identity, but also a claim to space that highlighted the intersecting identities of Puerto Ricans. I also cannot forget to mention the group of Puerto Rican women and other activists who stepped up to help the families and partners of victims and survivors by offering translation services and other means of support when the city was arguably not prepared to meet the needs of this growing community. Their actions challenged exclusionary practices and represent the refusal of this important facet of the Puerto Rican community to be silenced. Now, given everything that I've just said, is there more work to be done? Of course. For instance, one point that I heard time and time again is that we need to do more to help recent migrants understand the political process here in Florida. Are there challenges and tensions? Absolutely. In fact, several of my participants spoke about the com competition for limited funding and the sometimes conflicting opinions among other activists and leaders in the community on how to accomplish common goals. But where I see the hope is that there were moments where those differences were put aside, even if momentarily, which I think is important to, be, to consider at a bipartisan event such as this, where many of us have different political stances and beliefs. In many ways, these examples uniquely express the demand for representation, visibility, and inclusion. They speak not only to the potential of the Puerto Rican community to work together towards the common goal of advancement, but also to carve out a space in Florida that is unequivocally theirs. So in closing, there's a quotation that I think is really fitting written by a scholar of diaspora studies named Robin Cohen. He wrote, quote, diasporas tend to be messy and ragged at the edges, end quote. I think that engaging with the Puerto Rican community here in Florida, especially those who are migrating and those who are doing the work on the ground, like many of you in this room are, can help us capture those messy and ragged edges of everyday life. Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to add um, one comment uh, to, uh, to what our panelists have discussed. And it's probably, it's a nuance that perhaps most people don't really understand how power is exercised in Tallahassee and or Washington. And power is exercised inside the caucuses. So when you're in the caucus, that is the Republican caucus or Democratic caucus, they, every morning they get together and they decide, you know, what the bills are today and where they're going to vote for or for against. The Republicans vote for or vote for against. The Democrats vote for or against. They do that in caucus. That's how it's done. Right? Now, what we're trying to do is that when Victor Torres stands up in caucus, they listen to him. What do the parties over here listen to? Money and votes. So what, what I have learned in my many years of po political power, political uh, uh, activity, is to understand that if you can't bring money to the table, you better bring votes to the table. The best example of that is here in, in, in Florida, you see it in the Cuban community. In our Cuban community, our, our colleagues there, you see that they bring money to the table. So when a Cuban American stands up in caucus, and they say we should oppose the sanctuary cities or we should support sanctuary cities, they listen. Right? On the Democratic side, the African American community doesn't bring a lot of money to the party. But what they bring is votes to the party. So when the African American legislator stands up and says we should support this bill or oppose that bill, the Democratic Party has to listen. That's what we have to do for both the Republicans and Democrats when they're in caucus. If we show them by financial support, and all of you have made a financial support, a contribution to be here, but you do it in their campaigns, and you go out and you vote, and you make your people come out to vote, that empowers them, and that's how you get political power. Okay, so thank you very much for this panel, and we're going to go to our next panel. We have a, a switch panel, please. Okay.
Thank you.